right, let's bring this meeting to order. This is the uh, August 17th, 2021 New Report Conservation Commission meeting uh, taking place on the Zoom platform. This meeting's being recorded. Uh, first item on the agenda are the meeting minutes from August 3rd, 2021. Any uh, comments, suggestions, changes? I had one really, really minor, just um, sort of typo down on the top of page two, where it shows in red, I said it can be seen, that should just be be seen. But aside from that, nothing, I didn't have any other changes. Anybody else? Okay. And to approve as amended. Second. All right, uh, let's see who we got here. Steve Moore. Yes. David Vine. Yes. Dan Warshall. Yes. And I vote yes. Okay, next item. Um, do we have, we had, you were saying we have some Plum Island updates, Julie? Um, just very quickly, not a big update, but um, we did hear from the mayor that um, she was in communication with the Army Corps of Engineers and Department of Conservation and Recreation, and it looks like the uh, planned dredge of the Merrimack River is still on target. Um, they have everything they need and ducks in a row. Looks like they're going to start or they're hoping to start in late October, the actual dredge, mm -hmm. which is really fast. Um, so that would be great. And then we'd get the sand on the beach this winter. Um, and hopefully do some good before we get into the you know major part of the storm season. So that's that's all. That be, because of that, it also looks like the coir bag project, coir envelopes that the that we permitted prior to the dredge, um, that they that might get held off on. Because um, additionally, aside from the conflict in the two projects in terms of timing, um, I believe that the state has said they, they do not have the money for that right now to give us $450,000. And the city has not allocated $450,000. So at this point, it seems like that project will be put on hold. Okay. Really, um, any, any plan yeah. to plant dune grass out there this fall or next spring? Yeah, so some, some neighbors have been planting dune grass out there this past spring um, around the area of 77th Street, and they've done a great job, um, one resident in particular. But um, beyond that, no, we don't have um, dune grass planting planned. DCR had included um, in their um, application for the nourishment after the dredge that they would have a planting plan that they would put together that we could look at and approve. So I believe it is part of what they're gonna be doing after the stand is placed. But in addition to that, um, I don't know if you remember Greg Moore, the professor at UNH, um, who helped us out with a lot of work out there several years ago. Um, he has put in an application to the National Fish and Wildlife Federation to um, do a really big project up and down the coast um, from the Great Marsh where it begins down in Essex and that area up through the seacoast, including Plum Island and um, the dunes in Newburyport for planting, fencing, um, and all sorts of work like that. So we would be included in that project if he gets that grant. Good. Okay. All right. Um, so the next thing we have a uh, update on uh, Evergreen? Yes, and um, Tom Hughes is here. I will promote him to a panelist so he can provide a quick update on what's been happening out there since the um, pollinator meadow and the rain gardens were mowed accidentally. All right, good evening. Um, so, uh, since I last uh, discussed this with you, um, we have met on site a few times and met with the HOA. Um, and I've talked to Julia about this. Um, the HOA is taking this as a, um, as a kind of signal that they wanna, as they're taking over the HOA, 
contracting and all that, that they really want to tighten up contracts with the landscapers to make sure that all of this um, material from the permit is attached and very clear. Um, we've talked about a couple things um, with uh, John Eric and with Steve Sawyer, uh, the engineer on the project, and uh, and then talk to Julia, and we're looking at making some O and M changes for the stormwater that they all think makes sense and makes it a much easier maintenance protocol for the uh, for the rain gardens. We would basically turn them into a mode rain garden as opposed to something that has to be constantly weeded. Um, we're finding it problematic to have these uh, rain gardens in the middle of a giant meadow area that keeps generating seed. So. Um, it's just not tenable to continue to mow, I mean, to, to, to remove weeds in that scenario. So we think regular mowing is a way that we can make sure that those things are maintained on a regular basis. Um, in terms of the impact to the pollinator meadow, it certainly looks as time has gone by, like some areas were affected more than others. Rather than doing a full stem count and an analysis to determine um, any areas that would require overseeding, um, the HOA will just be going forward and doing overseeding over the entire area that was mowed. Um, and that will be done with a special formulation of the wildflower mix. The wildflower mix that went down is a mix of wildflowers and grasses. The mowing wouldn't have impacted the grasses at all. And the danger of overseeding with that same mix again is we would be doubling up on grasses, it would actually harm the wildflower population. So we're only overseeding with wildflowers themselves. Um, so the HOA and their contractor will be doing the, the spreading and I will be monitoring that to make sure it's done uh, appropriately. And that um, mentally I have a target date of that being done around mid-September, but I've got to work with the HOA's contractor on that. But um, anyhow, so I mean, the, the thing is I've been impressed at the um, desire of the HOA uh, management, which is now the, the residents, um, to really try to get this right in contracting so this doesn't happen again. And, uh, and I, think that, I think they're taking the right message from this, uh, you know, make sure it doesn't happen again. Tom, um, weren't there some shrubs that were also mowed? Yeah, so the shrubs that were mowed were within the rain gardens. And so you have a, a choice when you do rain gardens, right? You can do some that with a mulch bed with shrubs in it. And then you just continually weed around the shrubs and the shrubs grow. They don't really have any treatment value. It's more of a, an aesthetic and they provide a little bit of wildlife value. Um, and the other option is you have essentially a grass, you know, sort of meadow like thing that gets mowed maybe once every month or so when it reaches 12 to 18 inches or you know some height that that is pretty obvious you just get in and mow it um and what we realize is we don't really need to create any habitat with these rain gardens right if you look at what's around them i think we've created an awful lot of habitat out there and i think what's more important is having a, a viable long-term um, maintenance protocol that you won't have HOA after HOA, you know, membership saying we just can't keep having people out there weeding all the time. Um, it just doesn't seem workable. Uh, and this, you know, I think John Eric prefers it. And uh, Steve Sawyer actually is looking at this and saying this may be the last time he does a mulch rain garden again, um, just because it's been such a nightmare in terms of maintenance. So I, I forget where the, the rain gardens are. are. They are they in the pollinator meadow? They the, yeah they're they're some are in the pollinator meadow, some are in the fescue meadow. Um, so if you um, if you go into evergreen, like there's there's one that is surrounded by pollinator meadow, but it basically is between the homes, right? That one is the big deep one that's off of the cul-de-sac, which is called Gabari. Um, then there is, there are two that are within the fescue meadow. One that I think is technically in the fescue meadow, but it's right next to the pollinator meadow. And then the um, next one is entirely within the pollinator meadow. So I guess it needs to be very clear since they're 
in these meadows that aren't supposed to be mowed. Right. What it is they're mowing and, and maybe, I don't know, stakes put around them to show what, what it is they're supposed to mow. Yeah, so we're, we're going to be coming in with an operation and maintenance um, update, and Steve Sawyer is working on that. I will talk to him about that, and we'll try to figure out how we might do that. Um, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's a ring of some um, markers or plants or something. Um, you know, we'll try to figure out something so it's really obvious. And can you all see what I just put up? Yeah. Yep. So, this yeah. Is, so you can see... Um, the rain garden down at the bottom, which is labeled one on the plan, original plan set, it was uh, rain garden B. So that's pollinator. Um, the next one up, number two there is, I refer to it in my reports as rain garden C. That is entirely fescue. The one above that is fescue and the one above that is fescue. So those are all in areas. The surrounding areas are mowed regularly, you know, once a month-ish. I think the protocol is, is no more than once every two weeks. And then up above that, you've got the one that's in the pollinator meadow. So right number five there. So, you know, our plan is to come in with an O&M update to change those over. Um, and then, you know, we're gonna be working with the HOA with, you know, any, any help they need for me, uh, you know, I'm available to help them to, to, you know, give them the documents, whatever they need in order to attach to contracting and make sure that in the future, it's really clear because what happened is I guess all this stuff was provided to the uh, landscape contractor, but then the HOA management company um, signed a contract that reflected the right frequency of mowing, but didn't actually attach these documents. So even though they were given to them to bid and the landscapers should have been aware of all the things since they bid on it, but they just said, oh, I got to mow this once a year, you know, and went out and started. And luckily the equipment they were using was underpowered and the conditions were a little too wet. So the cutting wasn't very efficient. So I would say, you know, a good chunk of that pollinator meadow, the, um, you know, we've got some flowers are showing up, but whether or not it's the full assortment that was seeded would take, you know, doing three meter plots. But instead of doing that, like I said, we'll just overseed and, uh, and be done with it. And there's certain paperwork as far as um, indicating that on these contract documents for the future. That yeah, that's exactly what the HOA leadership is talking about, making sure that the, they don't issue another landscape contract without this worked in and um and actually doesn't the city approve their landscape protocol every well we approve the landscape plan in terms of the list of chemicals um and sort okay. of maintenance techniques that the the landscaper is going to be using so they right. supply to us like the spec sheets on everything that they're going to use out there and it's looked at by us and by the water division but um you know, we weren't, they're not giving us a sketch or a map like this, showing us right. locations of where they're doing things. Um, Tom, just curiously, I can see how, you know, if they had this map, they would be able to see that this pathway right here is a delineation between right. pollinator right. meadow and, and lawn. But then in this area, how are they going to know where well, that? So, so right now is? that area was staked out when we did the, um, the reseeding. And, mm -hmm. you know, we were actually looking at getting out there and doing um, mowing and overseeding um, as needed. But the idea is the first time it's done, the stakes should be there. And then you start to establish a scar and it becomes mm -hmm. obvious. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, uh, you know, and if it, the devi if it deviates off, you know, one way or the other by five or 10 feet, that's not a big deal. You know, it's it's a it's a big meadow area, but um, right. the idea was not to have the open space full of markers, and you know, we have them for the no, no disturb areas and um, the various signage. But uh, we were we were hoping to get this established in a way that it's really kind of pretty obvious. And you do follow the path; the path is really helpful. And then if you look down at the bottom, you've got plantings that kind of help guide you where you turn. Um, mm -hmm. 
and then you're kind of keeping roughly the same distance off the other features that are out there. So it it shouldn't be very difficult for them to uh, to do. But, you know, so it does appear like you know it was just a contract that that probably should have had these things attached, and it's an HOA management company that didn't do it yep. so yep. um anyhow so so i'm encouraged by both how the how the pollinator meadow looks right now and also by the overseeding which which will ensure that this didn't set us back um i'm also encouraged by the hoa's um just overwhelming desire to do the right thing they really want to make sure that they don't have this happen again and that all of their contracting is sort of ironclad within the constraints of the permits. Good to hear. Yeah, and I'll I'll keep you guys up to date. And you know, Julia, as soon as overseeding is scheduled, I'll let you know. And we expect to be in in the next few meetings with that O and M update. The other thing I think we may want to add into that is we had talked during permitting, and I thought we had it in writing somewhere that you know we would be mowing you know two to three feet off the side of the paths but it's not actually spelled out anywhere that i can find mm -hmm. um just to maintain the paths so we're going to add into the o m table just a line that the footpaths can be mowed you know the the side two to three feet yep okay and that's where the signage will be as well so it makes sense and we decided in in the field i think we decided that we wouldn't go beyond where we're, we want to put the signage Right, right. And we're moving the signs, actually, the no disturb signs. Closer. Are, we're moving towards the path, which, right. uh, so they're closer to the path, which is fine yeah. by me because the wetland's actually a little bit bigger. Yeah. I mean, by the time, well, once we do our as built, I'll be able to give you a good idea, but I wouldn't be surprised if we have half to three quarters of an acre of additional wetland mm -hmm. just because of the way it worked out. Yep. Too much is better than too little. Yes. So, Anyhow, so I think that's all you need for me tonight, unless there's any questions or further feedback. No. Okay, great. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. <clears throat> all right, next item is uh, Catherine Tanner and Adam Penn, 12 K Street, request for determination of applicability. Okay. I'm going to. Um, Make Adam Penn a panelist so that he can, and Noel as well as Noel. Um, so that they can present the project. And I've, I have up here just a photograph of the site. And this is the deck that's in, that's looking to be expanded by two feet. All right, guys, if you want to, uh... Unmute yourselves. Hello. I know. Hello. And hi, Adam. Hi, Adam's not here yet. He's on his way up 95. I'm Kathy. I'm here. Okay. Here's a um, here's just a location map so you can see where the property is the end of K Street. Beyond that is just some broken down sort of um, buildings back here and then the marsh. And here again is a photo of the deck. Noel, do you wanna just give a quick run through of what the applicant is proposing? Yeah, so my name is Noel Lochtman and my company is Joppa Design and our clients came to us wanting to work on their deck and and replace it and they'd like to replace it. It comes out about 10 and a half feet now off the back of the house. And they'd just like it to be a couple of feet bigger than that. And the proposal is to use as many of the existing footings for the new deck, but the line of footings that we're looking at right now, those four, I'd like to replace those further out with five new diamond pier footings for this deck. And Could you explain what a diamond pier is and also it, whether it's five or six that you're going to do? It's, we're going to do six. There's, we're going to, um, 
there's another footing that is questionable whether it would be, be able to be used or not. But the five out here that these four that we're looking at right now would be replaced with five. And there's a document that shows what the diamond pier looks like. It's, it's just a very small hole in the ground that's made to, for this concrete bollard. It's a trap, like a, a pyramid shaped hole and it's maybe about a foot square, a little bit larger that's removed. And then that is placed into the ground. And then four rods are forced into the ground and it works like a, uh, a pile driven into the sand, you know, for a house or something like a steel pile works like that, where the ground around the piles actually contribute to the strength of the footing. They're very strong and very low impact. And, and how deep are they going? Just what I see. Not even a picture. foot. I mean, it's a, just a small pyramid shaped hole that they sit in. And I'm trying to figure out why they're strong and so forth if they're only embedded a foot. Well, they, um, they're engineered like piles where a pile works that the, the soil around it for a, a uh, a given amount contributes to the strength of the, you know, like a friction pile. These work the same as a friction pile where actually there's like a, um, uh, the strength of these four rods going into the ground acts like a 20 inch concrete pile. Oh, has I an equal strength pile. of that. Yeah, so they actually go deeper. It's just this head that that uh, is. Uh, yes, shallow. there's four rods that get driven into the ground. Uh -huh. So they get driven into the ground as we're looking. That from that bottom picture, they just yes, that's okay. them using a yes, that's a, a a pneumatic hammer, like an electric jackhammer that's used to push them into the ground. And they go through the concrete bollard and then into the ground completely. And then there's caps that go on top. The top is finished already to receive a six by six call, uh, post. Okay, so there's those what, are that's, caps. That's what it looks like done. All right. It's, so you can I'm see trying to that. figure it out. Yeah. Yep. Is there some kind of a test on these as far? Because I mean, all kinds of different soils, you could be putting this in soup and uh, you wouldn't necessarily get the capacity you want. Is there? Uh, There's a low chart um, that, that, so th there's two models of these that you select for the soil type that you have. So, this is for like a sand and, and the sand there. I mean, most of the time, helical anchors or anything else, you're, you're doing some type of test on them. I'm trying to figure out what dictates whether this has got good embedment and the soils are as good as you anticipate. It works in various unexcavated soils and there's a soils chart that was associated with it. Um, there, the, I, the, there's a 750 version also, which I think the, the only difference is, if I'm not mistaken, is that the rods are longer, but I'm not 100% certain about that. But for, for sandy soil, this was fitting the bill just fine. And I've actually, since I've researched this, I've been seeing them on the island quite a bit. They're nice because there's very minimal disturbance of the ground. You know, if you were digging a concrete footing, which you're not allowed to do here, but um, it's not only just the size of the footing that you're excavating for, but you also have to have, you know, you're digging an overdig so that you can, you know, so this doesn't have any of that. Okay. Okay. Um, just for the record, uh, Noel's finishing up a project at my house. Um, 
I don't think I have a conflict of interest, but if anybody thinks I do, then we don't have a quorum. Well, that's the. Uh, now you announced it, so we'll uh, we'll see. Um, I guess questions I have with this project, um, bigger questions. Yeah, if you click on that one, Julie, um, are the this whole house is up on piles? Yes, it is. Okay, so we don't allow lattice to come all the way to the ground, or uh, or concrete pavers like that. I don't know if anybody else has any uh, qualms with regards to that, but. Um... Yes, it would depend on when they were installed, you know, was it before they were not allowed. Sorry, I don't have any information to give on that. No, I haven't checked aerials or anything. It looks like it's not a new house. Um, they, to me, they look like they might have been original, but not sure. It looks like one of the first ones that's been on piles out there to me, but. Okay. I looked this, I looked, um, you know, at the flood zone also. It's actually, strangely enough, outside of the um, high hazard flood area, um, which is pretty interesting for this location. Well, in that case, do we have anything else? I don't have anything else. I, I don't have any issues with the uh, with those with those footings or whatever we call them. Um, so, what would we like to do? I'll make a motion to issue it. I think it's a negative two determination. Second. Uh, David Vine. Yes. Steve Moore. Yes. Dan Warshall. Yes. I vote yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, no, I'll, I'll send that to you like we discussed. Okay. Terrific. Okay. Have a good evening. Yep. You too. All right. Next item is Stephanie Harville, uh, 192 Northern Boulevard, request for minor modification. Good evening. Tom Hughes with Hughes Environmental Consulting. Um, Stefan Hoville is the new owner of 192. And um, as you guys remember, we spent a great deal of time on this project. Um, in the purchase process, there were some questions of some items that were on the plan, and uh, we wanted to make sure it was clear. It was pretty clear. Um, but it, something wasn't labeled and that was a uh, underbuilding storage area. So we added that. And then the other thing that was not shown, um, which, you know, in hindsight, we should have shown something, I suppose, um, is a utility shelf to put air conditioning compressors, et cetera, on. And uh, Stefan would also like to put a generator on. So what we've done is we've labeled this area um, hung storage space. This is showed in, shown in the permit drawings um, in the, um, the elevation views as skirted, um, you know, down to the, the allowable elevation. And you can kind of see it's there, but there was no label. So we Wait, wanted to just- Wait, Tom, stop, yeah. because I just went back and reviewed those old plans and there, there's nothing shown. So, it's just, you can see skirting coming down, but there's right. no, that's it. it 
It doesn't say, and here's where utility shelf is going to go. No, no, no it, exactly. So, so well, no, the, on the, I'm not talking utility shelf. Um, I'm talking about the area where it says hung storage space off on the left. Oh, yes, so, yes, yes. Yeah. So that area is shown and that, yep. and, and, and you're absolutely right. We did not show an area for the um, HVAC or for a generator. So, um, what the applicant would like to do would be to put an elevated platform off on the side of the house. Um, it will be elevated up. Uh, it's going to be about two and a half feet to the underside and the, um, it's going to have AZAC decking with half inch spacing. So water will get through. Um, there'll be some light penetration that will come in at roughly one to one from the side. So I figure that we're probably gonna end up with maybe 20 square feet of overall um, potential vegetation impacts from this platform. Um, so we did have in our final approved table, we did have more than a 20 square foot increase in um, proposed vegetation, but if, if the commission would like, we could uh, reduce the um, patio area to, to try to accommodate that as well. So that was something I want to talk to you about. But if we look at the vegetation table, I think that should be on the plan. Um, yeah, hold on. Here. Right. Okay. So if we zoom in on um, total vegetated, you can see that uh, we started with 68, 64, and we end up with 69, 67. So a little bit of impact from the utility shelf certainly could work within those numbers or if the commission wanted we could try to reduce the patio area but i do remember we came in for the um with the patio area because there was at least one commissioner that felt that you know we should have some outdoor space so that you know people don't create their own uh so if we take a look at the plan view you can kind of see where that patio area is and I think it's drawn square. You know, we could probably round the corners a little bit and trim that back and get you in a plan, you know, pretty quickly that would produce 20 more square feet uh, out of that. Um, or, you know, I, I think I think there is room for the vegetation impact within our overall numbers. And these are not units that need to be serviced regularly. I mean, I know some people say that HVAC and generators should be, you know, maintained annually, but I know plenty of people who have had generators that aren't maintained every year, but even if they were just going back there to, to look at them, you know, once a year, it's not going to have a vegetative impact and it doesn't require a footpath or anything like that. Yeah, I don't think I have much of an issue with uh, with that shelf. I'm not gonna say enough. Tom, if you raised it up to three feet, would that cause any problems? Um, it does because of the um, separation it has to have from windows and ignition sources and all these other things. Um, they had and and also in order to be able to service it you don't want to have it too high off the ground, but uh, they are as high as we could set them without, you know, creating issues with having to redesign where windows and things on that next level up are. That thing is going to shake that house when it goes. Yeah. But then again, you know, something, if you lose power, I imagine you, you probably would appreciate a little shaking. Yeah. Well, my, mine's behind the house and I can uh, like five feet from the house. It's, yeah. Uh, it's loud. No, I mean, I literally have guys with nail guns on my house right now and that's loud enough. I don't know if you guys hear the occasional pop and bang behind me, but uh, the whole house seems to shake every once in a while. So can, I can, can imagine what it generated the, do. The profile again. Yep. Okay, so the two and a half feet is to the bottom of this. Right. Okay, so and above in that uh, rectangular 
um, area there. That is the members, the uh, structural members that are, so it's actually higher than two and a half feet up. So, yeah, so what you're seeing that rectangle down below is the shelf that the, um, that the utilities would sit on. And then um, the actual structural member of the house is up above where you see that first story above arrow. Um, this is a building with parking underneath and skirting that came down to that, um, that elevation where we're showing the shelf. So basically it's not gonna be any lower than the approved skirting. Okay, uh, that, that's what my, was, my concern was, was that it, we were gonna lose some of the two and a half with structural member, but. No, no, the bottom of the unit you see is the, um, is the bottom of the, of the unit. Okay. Okay. We have anything else? Any uh, determination on whether we want uh, want that twenty square feet of uh, vegetation maintained? Um, Tom, what are what are the dimensions of the of the patio? Um. Give me a second. It's actually, if we go up to the top, it should, I, Everett may have separated out the patio as a standalone. If he did. He did. Uh, well, walkway slash patio, 171 square feet. Right. So uh, that, that includes the walkway too. So. Which is where? This little thing that, right that here? And the, that and the left-hand side. There's another walkway that right there. Here. Um, I can, I I want to say it was like 12 by 12, but hold on a second. Let me. It looks like it will be around the 12 by 12 if this is 20 feet right here. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting into my Adobe where I can just use my measure tool. Give me a second. Yeah, 12 by 12 is not huge, but it's enough for some patio furniture. Right. So if, if you rounded the corners off, it would. Yeah, it is. It is an inch by an inch. It's tiny, it's, so it's one square inch. Um, so this is a 10 scale, so it's 100 square feet. So it's 10 feet by 10 feet. So I, if we make it much smaller, then we might increase the desire down the road to, to creep. But I mean, certainly if we rounded, you know, if we rounded those little corners a little bit, that, that wouldn't be much, but um, I would hesitate to make it too much smaller. But I, I'm okay. It is, I think. What's that? I'm okay with leaving it the way it is. Okay. It's not I that. Too. Yeah, I'm fine. All right. We got anything else? Hey, I'll make a motion. This is a minor modification, right? Yes. Make a motion to approve the minor modification. Second. All right. Uh, Steve Moore. Yes. Dan Warshaw. Yes. David Vine. Yes. And I vote yes. All right. Thank you. Next item is Eileen Bakoff, 13 Basin Street, Certificate of Compliance. Yes. Good evening. Tom Hughes with Hughes Environmental Consulting. Um, you may remember this project. Um, Eileen was looking to put a um, a handicapped accessible entry into her home and um, you guys uh, issued an approval for that. It was a variance so that we could have the threshold uh, low enough and line up with the floor so that we could get a wheelchair in. Um, and we agreed during the hearing, even though we weren't impacting vegetation to plant a couple plants. And if, um, so if you look at this, you can see um, the as-built, Everett's written a letter, everything looks good that way. I sent in a picture of um, two blueberry bushes that were planted on site um, and they are doing well. And uh, I also followed up with an additional set of pictures of the improvements that were done. Um, I don't know if you have those loaded. Yeah, just a sec. I thought that I loaded them, but I'm not seeing them here. So hold on one second. I'll see if I can find Or do you want, do you want to just stop sharing and I can share my screen then just pull them up? Um, sure. Well, let me see. I might have them pretty quick. Hold on okay. a second. Yep. 
No, I don't. So yeah, if you could do that, that would be great. Okay. Um, Okay. Okay. So Okay, so don't pay any attention to that one. That one. Here we go. So here's a side view of the entry and This is a front view of the entry. And there are the blueberry bushes, a little bit better scale. So you can see the two that were planted right there. Okay. All right. So if you want, I can stop sharing now and resume. Tom, when were, when were those blueberry bushes planted? Um, they were this spring. Okay. Like late spring. It, is that when you took these photos? By chance? Um, this I would have to check when I so, when I got this, but yeah, I mean it. It's um roughly I would say it. It was in, this, in the spring. Or so yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm just curious because I was out there and I took some of my own photos, and the I think that they put um some sort of like bird netting or covers over the bushes. Um, I just didn't recognize this because my photo shows something with a cover over it, but they must have covered them to keep the, the animals off the blueberries, I'm guessing. Right, right. I imagine a little yeah. fair fight for the blueberries is probably yeah. That's, yeah. That's what I would do. So. Yeah. yeah, but this might look good. Looks good. Yeah, yeah. No, and seeing as we didn't really have any vegetation impacts, um, you know, I'm I'm pretty happy with them and I think they do add some value out there. So where are these bushes in relation to the house? They are, so here's the house, right? Here's the, um, I guess that would be the northern side of the house. And then this is the gravel parking area that actually kind of fades out in this area, but it's just at the very edge of the gravel parking area off on the right. Um, and the neighbor has some plantings kind of just off image um, to the north of this. So. We felt like that was kind of a good spot so they wouldn't just be standing out on their own. Yeah, so the addition is over to the left, just adjacent to the driveway. Right. Addition is somewhere over here. Okay. okay. Anything else? That's it. Is there a motion? Motion to issue the certificate of completion. Second. All right, uh, Steve Moore. Yes. Jan Warshaw. Yes. David Vine. Yes. And I vote yes. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. All right, have a good night. Right. You Thanks. too. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, bye. All right, can I get a motion to open the public hearings? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Um, so uh, Lorraine and Michael Riley to Spofford Street, we uh, got a request to uh, continue. Um, Tom, do you want to uh, say something since you're still here? I'm still here. Um, yeah, we, we got the numbers and I'm just going through the regulatory analysis and I didn't have enough time to get it into you um, prior to the week ahead. And um, it turns out that the footpaths, as, as I was reading, I need to do some more research to make sure, but the footpaths being of um, bluestone uh, may not qualify for that exemption. So I'm looking through some administrative decisions to see uh, whether it does or not. And we may e either go through a subsection that allows us to mitigate for that or, um, or look at a different material. So. So we've, we've just got a little bit more work to do, but we expect to be in at the next meeting and try to get this thing uh, closed out. Okay. All right. Uh, so you want to, you want a continuance until what is our next one? The 7th? Yes. September? Yep. 
Okay. Can I get a motion? Motion to continue to September 7th. Second. All right, Steve Moore. Yes. David Vine. Yes. Dan Warshaw. Yes. Can I have a yes? Thank you very All much. Right. Thank you, finally. All right, get a motion to close the public hearings. No move. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay. Do we have anything else? Um, Julia, you had sent something from BSC about that area where National Grid is. Um, yep. I was kind of curious about that as far as uh, did they, have they given us a planting plan? As, um, as well, they originally gave us a planting plan and, and they gave us that sort of design scenario that showed where they, that they were gonna put these sort of like shrubs plugged into that crushed stone and um, thought that it was all gonna work out. Clearly it didn't. Um, and you got the last email, right, that I forwarded to you all from Teresa, at, from the BSC consultant for National Grid. She said that they had some failures of some of those and they were planning on replanting them this fall and following up with us. So I, I, I can't recall that planting plan. What I do remember is the evening that she was uh, discussing this with us. And I seem to remember photos of plants kind of intermingled with the, the stone, not a series of shrubs. Uh, right. What happened? I remember that too. That, that is what they, they didn't really give us a planting plan per se, because it wasn't supposed to be, um, you know, they didn't have it like landscaped at that kind of level. The goal was to just get some sort of growth of vegetation and shrubs in and in, in amongst the stones. Um, like you remember, and you know, they haven't really taken. Um, I think we were all a little curious about it to begin with, but they showed us those photos of how it's worked in other locations and it seemed like an okay idea. Um, so far, it just hasn't quite panned out the way I think they were hoping. It's been almost a year since we heard from them, isn't it? Or... Well, we just got an email back from um, BSC, who was the consultant on the project, letting us know that they had some lack of survival of some of the shrubs over the winter and that they were planning on replanting this fall. I mean, even the shrubs look, it, it seemed to me that even before they all died, there was only like six or eight of them or something. I mean, it's a pretty yeah. large area. I know. Do you want me to have them come in? Do you want me to see if I can get them on the agenda for our next meeting so we can talk about it directly? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to have a, a better idea what this is finally going to look like because I was yeah. kind of shocked when I saw those go in in the first place, the shrubs, because it's a large area and they picked just a couple of spots. I don't know if it's supposed to uh, move outward or something or, or what and fill in the gaps, but whatever it is, it it seemed kind of uh, uh, makeshift at best. Yep, I agree. I think we should have them come in and explain their plan to us in more detail and whether or not how, how we can be assured that it's actually going to work the way they indicated it would. And if not, then we need a new design. Mm -hmm. I agree. Okay, thanks. See if I can get them maybe for the next meeting or maybe later in September, um, first or second meeting in September. Well, considering that the planting season is going to be coming pretty soon, it'd probably be good if somebody from their office could be at the next meeting. Yeah, okay. I didn't make that happen. Okay. Teresa is usually pretty responsive, so hopefully handle this. Okay. Um, another thing, um, we had uh, a couple of meetings last week with uh, uh, land stewardship companies. Um, we had a video meeting with uh, Matt Smith from Woodman Inc. 
and uh, also Steve and I walk around um, some of the properties with uh, Chris and Jessica from uh, Land Stewardship Inc. And um, we've gotten a couple of uh, proposals, I guess. Um, I actually haven't even gone through them yet, but I figured I'd, I'd bring it up. Yeah, I think the key point, Joe, to make too is that whoever we go with, um, it's likely that we are going to be asking the commission to spend some money annually on the costs for this service, um, which is essentially monitoring and management activities on the city's open spaces that are uh, either owned or controlled by the, or overseen by the Conservation Commission. So it's it's entirely sort of germane under the Wetlands Protection Act for the commission to use its um, funds in this way. Um, we've never done it and we just sort of like leave the money and occasionally there's something that we spend it on, but usually not. So currently there's about 60 something thousand in the Conservation Commission fund. And in going through our annual um, revenues, it looks like we generally have um, taken in somewhere around 10,000 a year in permitting fees. So that gives us a buffer of which we could spend maybe some of what's incoming without having to dip into the larger balance and sort of save that for something that might come up in the future that we might need to dip into. But um, in any case, given that we have um, a revenue stream, it seems like some operational funds for open space management might not be a bad idea. So, uh, so we're not, there's no discussion happening about uh, putting a line item in the, in the uh, city budget? To not up. yet, not yet. I think if the, I think if the fund, if the needs went beyond what the commission could cover um, with what we bring in in revenue annually, then I think that would be cause to go and dip into the sort of general fund. But given that it is conservation related and we do have the funds, then it is sort of like what it can be spent on. Yeah. Um, it's, it saves us from having to essentially, it saves us from having to go to the city council and have them approve something every year with the politics around that. Who knows, you know, it's just maybe easier to stick with our own funding. Okay. Yeah, it seems to me that, that makes that makes a lot of sense and gives us more control over, you know, the the um, the scope of work, you know, what exactly is going to work for us. Um, I don't mind spending some money on this and, and maybe the 10,000 is, is the right amount, but, you know, the city keeps acquiring land with no plan to do any, you know, to, how to maintain it or, or manage it. So I don't think it's unreasonable to expect part of this to come from the general budget. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, even like even like ten thousand from the general budget and any special projects that uh, that need to be done, um, boardwalk replacement or installation or something, you know, we can we can pay for. Um, but it would be nice if we got a little backing from the city who was right. who was approving all these land purchases. Right. So I, I don't think it's unreasonable to insert a line item in the budget and that it's a flexible amount from year to year, depending on what we, what we think we want. But we probably need to start that process because who knows how long it'll take. Yeah. OK, well, that's that's reasonable, too. Um, I don't see why that wouldn't be something we should ask um, the mayor's office for. Um, First, we would need to, you know, make the determination on which of these two groups we would like to go with, um, and then maybe refine their sort of budget a little bit more and come up with a draft contract and take it to the mayor's office and see um, what she thinks about adding it in as a as a budget item. Um, so yeah, we just have a little bit of more process to go through, but we could certainly do that. But I also agree with Dan that, you know, having some control using our own funding gives us um, a little bit more freedom to um, handle things without. It, it does, but I think, uh, I don't know who else is gonna handle any of this. You know, yeah. it, it would be us handling it anyways. Yeah, yeah. So. 
you know, but I think we're going to have, we're, we're the ones driving it. We're the ones who want to do it. And um, just a little uh, to Steve's point that the city keeps acquiring properties, you know, that we want it, we want them to look good, be well-maintained and everything. So. Um, so maybe a sort of a, a scenario where we, well, we were talking about with the budget for this um, being sort of like the, a baseline annual fee and then expenses that might go at an hourly rate beyond that for special items that were included in the in the sort of baseline. If maybe we divide that where the city has the baseline as line item in the budget and then any extra additional costs get paid for by commission. That, that that's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, just just do the take care of the baseline stuff. And, you know, if we want anything else done, we pay for it. talk about that i think that's a good idea so who who decides on which one of these two groups gets the contract <laughs> well we have a follow-up with matt um smith next week i believe um mm -hmm. and i think we should maybe have a internal meeting before that follow-up and um discuss again where we think we want to go but um yeah, I don't know. We'll have to talk about that. I don't think we can make that call right now, but it would be our, our little committee that would come in, I guess. Well, I'm leaving for six weeks on Thursday. So this this Thursday. This Thursday. Okay. Well, so we have we have six weeks to decide on who we want. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was well, leaning we are toward, I was leaning toward land stewardship inc. just because they, they seem to understand the science somewhat but you know i think either one of them would yeah. be duly noted yes duly noted we'll look at those types of uh you know i think there'll be factors included one of which is what you were saying steve about sort of the background knowledge base and science and whatever it is that we need but then there's also the cost um yeah. and resources and all that kind of thing so we'll maybe we'll put together a little decision matrix and um, let you know all about it at home. <laughs> you, you will have uh, access to email there, won't you? Um, every now and then. Oh. Where are you okay. going? Uh, we're, we're doing a road trip out to Utah. Oh. So we'll be in some places where there is no phone, no internet, no nothing. Are you doing the national parks? Yeah. Yep. Zion, Arches. Zion, Arches, Bryce, Capitol Reef, Canyonlands. It's a great area. Beautiful. Hey, take That's pictures awesome. and share, please. I want yeah. to go up there, too. Okay. Yeah. A lot of rattlesnakes we'll just... out there. <laughs> Cougars, too, apparently. Yeah. All right. Well, you have a good time there, Stephen. Okay. Um, Julie, did you want to talk about our favorite harbor master? Oh, yeah. Yes, did you get the email from yeah. him? They put it up here. Um, this is the email for those of you who was in C um, from the Harbor Master Paul Hogg. And as, as a quick background, they put up a shed at the Plum Island parking lot several years ago without a building permit, without um, any kind of permitting, actually, especially through the Conservation Commission. Um, it was replacing a shed that was already there. But it was significantly larger and not elevated above, um, you know, two feet above grade. Turns out in this particular location, it's the AE zone and considering that it's a shed um, rather than a dwelling or a garage, it doesn't um, need to be elevated more than one foot above grade. Um, but as Steve has pointed out, it's not even elevated one foot above grade in certain corners of the shed. Um, so, Long story short, Paul came came back in after the sort of violation notice was issued when he first put this thing up, came in with a notice of intent um, and after the fact notice of intent in which it was agreed that he would elevate it. That's, that was what going on two years ago now. Um, it still hasn't been elevated. So this is his latest response as to why. Um, and you can all just take a look and let me know how you wanna handle it. Well, as a taxpayer, I might say, okay, never mind. 
um, as a conservation commissioner, if this were a private individual and we were in this same situation, A, it wouldn't have gone on this long, <clears throat> and B, they would have made the, the correction that was necessary. So I, I don't feel like giving the city a break. And I think they, they need to do what needs to be done. How off is it from one foot? I mean, is it uh, one small area or is it? It's, the whole the it's on a slope. So on, on the downhill side, it's probably, a, if it's not two feet, it's close to two feet. But the uphill side, it's right level with the ground or maybe an inch or two off of it. Yeah, so. So on average, maybe of it's off. Oh. Yeah. So do you happen to know, was the shed constructed on site or was it brought in as a, as a prefabricated unit? It, well, sort of a combination, right? It was a modular, I mean, it was a prefab thing that they brought to the site and then put it together on site. Yeah, that's, you know that, I mean? that's how my shed, last shed was made. That it was on a so flat bed. The, 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 the pieces. The walls are pre pre built, yeah. and so they just stack them up and exactly yeah. GPS did it. They didn't hire anyone to do it. It was delivered by Reed's Ferry Shed, and then GPS guys came out and, and like put the thing up, um, you know. And they just it just didn't occur to them because there was already a shed there. They needed to get themselves out of the Coast Guard facility across the street with the other storage elements and things like that for the the lifeguards they just didn't think you know and so that's all i mean for for a while but it i recall is the shed on the pavement yes yeah uh well, it's not resting on the pavement it is elevated no i know but correct, I mean, it's, right there's it's, a ramp that comes down it, it's but on yes, the pavement it's, it's over it's pavement yes it's yeah. over it's the paved area. Yeah, I mean, given given the fact that it's sitting over pavement, there's really there's not really any migration of sand to to consider. I mean, it's just there's not sand migrating around the shed. Any that does is being swept away to to clean the pavement every year or whenever every couple of years. I don't know. I'm I'm not sure. I I I get your point, Steve. We we want to make sure that we're consistent, but what are we? really accomplishing in this case? Well, I think if you have floodwaters coming in there, which could conceivably happen and has happened, um, no. the water could not flow underneath. Um, so that- Well, it could. I mean, some of it, it's, it's ele it is elevated. It's not sitting totally at grade, whereas this, the previous shed was sitting totally at grade. Um, Do we know how, is shed anchored to anything? I think it's just sitting on the cement blocks. I, I'm not sure of that. I've never looked that closely. Oh, we'll find uh, out with the first really big storm that hits there. I mean, I guess that's going to be it, really. I mean, this thing, if, if, if the flood comes, it's, it's going to yeah. get... Of it off of the off of the footing, so they're going to have to redo it anyway. Well, and if they really are cement blocks, those aren't going to hold up to much water flow. No, no, no. And, then, and then they'll have and to for, redo for, the whole thing. Yeah, and for floodwaters in this location, practically speaking, it's a wide open parking lot. So yeah, it will be an impediment to the flow of floodwaters, but at the same time, it's not pushing them. We're not in an inland situation where it's going to be impacting someone else because it can't go through the or underneath that particular shed. Um, there's no one's house that's right next to it where waves are going to be refracted off of it and into somewhere else. Um, so it is a slightly more beneficial location for something like this. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of leaning toward uh, not pursuing this any further, even, even though uh, it should be up at least one foot, which I agree, but. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would say if there's some kind of movement on this thing, or if it does get 
messed up by a flood or whatever, we'll just make sure they reconstruct it properly. So uh, yeah. it does seem like we'd be chasing a lot here just to get another foot. Yeah. And it, at least it won't go rolling off, <laughs> rolling, rolling like the last one did. But uh, I guess we'll find out. Well, I'll, I'll be okay. With, well, I won't be okay with it, but I won't pursue it any further. But believe me, if something happens out there, I'll be the first one to say, I told you so. Oh, that, and, yeah. and, and I'll be the second, and Dave will be the third, and Dan will be the fourth only because he always gets the meetings late. <laughs> and I, I got to say this, this, Steve, that I think um, at this point, the Harbor Master knows that the commission is watching what happens. I don't think that anything like this will happen yet. Oh. <laughs> Famous last words. Well, the you know, this optimist. Is, <laughs> you know, this is this is not the sounds like Susan not, Collins a couple of months ago. <laughs> <laughs> Try to be optimistic about the city. It's not the first time. I mean, you know, with the 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 gravel parking lot when they when they did that down at the um, yep waterfront. One fifteen. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, and this, it's like, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Well, there was the, a bath, the bathrooms out there, you know, the city was pleading poverty, you know, so they couldn't raise them to where they need be. I don't know if they flood there now or not. Well, they're, it seems like they're not open ever. Of course, I haven't been there in a while, but. Yeah. Yeah. But we digress. Yes. Uh, anyway, yeah, I mean, I think there's been sort of an institutional thing at, with at DPS where there's been a lack of communication between leadership at DPS over the years and other city departments, especially CONCOM and planning. But that is changing um, over time. It's changing for the better. So um, maybe that will filter down even more. Yeah, that's good. My concern has been that there's there's a sort of back room, um, you know, in some of these cases where it's like, okay, well, we'll just do it and then we'll go and ask for permission later and yeah. do it, get it done. The money's here now, the need is here now, whatever it is. And then, you know, so... I think it's two things. I think you're right, but I think it's it's that. Then maybe there's maybe there's been a little bit of that, especially with previous ad administrations and leadership. But now I think that there's just a thing. I think they are a lot better in communicating with us. I get calls all the time from DPS saying, "We want to do this down on Water Street at the lift station. Can you come out? What, what is it that we can do? What is it that we can't do?" For like little tiny questions, they'll call me sometimes. Well, but then on good. but then on something like this. They just put up a building and forget to ask. So I think there's also a piece of it nowadays that is really them just not knowing. You know what I mean? That Harbor Master says we're putting up this shed. He gets some DPS guys. They think the whole thing's approved. They have no idea. They just put the thing up. I, I do think that there's an element of that to it too. Well, I, I think they should be told if they haven't. If you want to do anything on Plum Island, you have to go to the compound. Regardless, if you're just sweeping the streets. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. The deputy director now over there, um, Jamie Ticolo, is excellent at communicating with me about whatever he's doing out there. So I'm, I'm, I really do feel um, like things are moving in the right direction. Fingers crossed, though. That's good. Yeah. All right. Now, do we have anything else? Well, I can't tell you how happy I was to see that the city's backing out of repairing that bridge to West Newbury. Oh, because <laughs> I suggested that a while ago. Wait, what? What's happening, Steve? Yeah, the city's oh, not. Uh, something I don't know. Well, it was in the paper. In the paper. Yeah. The city's yeah, they, backing out of it. The city's backing out of it. Which is really strange. They they have the detour signs up and everything. I mean, I it, after it, all that, I can't believe no one told me. Here I am talking about how well they communicate with me, and nobody told me that. Well, that was John Eric and the mayor, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I read that one. I, I talked to John both. Eric like three times a week. I can't believe he never said anything. All right, anyway, well, we'll, good to know. 
<laughs> Cascade, castigate him over email and include me. Oh, right? I will. Yep. <laughs> I, I might just call him right after this meeting. All right. Do you have anything else, Steve? No, I'm done. Okay. In that case, I'm done too. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.